Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Blueprint for Efficiency, a webinar series hosted by the, C the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. My name is Lizzie Horvitz, and I will be your host for this afternoon's presentation titled Big Data Meets Big Buildings, Real-Time Energy Management in Commercial Office Buildings. The Yale Center for Business and the Environment is pleased to launch our sixth annual installment of Blueprint for Efficiency. This series of public webinars emphasizes the latest opportunities for energy efficiency. Our presentation is recorded and available on the iTunes U page. Be sure to check out our next webinar, Thursday, February 27th, with Enernoc on developing a common energy language. In today's webinar, we will explore energy efficiency in commercial buildings. Market-leading real estate companies are using the meter data analytics to manage their buildings better. Our presenter, Philip Henderson, is a senior financial policy specialist with the Center for Market Innovations at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Finally, we would like to remind our listeners that we welcome any questions you might have, and we will direct them to our speaker at the conclusion of the talk. You can type any questions directly into the GoToMeeting chat window. And with that, we welcome Philip Henderson to Blueprint for Efficiency. Great. Thank you, Lizzie. Hello, everybody. Uh, again, this is Philip Henderson with NRDC, and I assume you can see my screen showing the cover of a report that we recently released, and I would like to take you through our findings. Very quickly, an overview. We studied one building owner's project across three large office buildings to use meter data analytics and monitoring, and we found that they were able to reduce electricity usage by 13% in one year across the three buildings. Very significant amount. There were many things they did, which I'm going to go through, and many reasons for the savings. But two critical elements are that they caught equipment running outside of parameters and corrected it, and they corrected set points that had escaped uh, notice. And I think there's a story here, which I'm going to tell. In that story, all buildings stray, even the best buildings. What do I mean by that? Things break, controls break, things stay on, would be off, and faults escape notice. They're hard to find. Building owners and engineers need actionable advice to keep buildings optimized, and I'm going to talk more about what I mean by optimized. And meter data is a great source of intelligence about how the building is operating. And then last, after we go through the study, I want to plant a seed with a question, which is, what could utilities do to help building owners obtain meter-based intelligence? Okay, in 2010, I saw impressive results in publications and reports about meter data analytics being used for better operations often called continuous commissioning, many other names for this kind of function. But many of the reports were from vendors, and many of the reports were about institutional buildings. So I decided to study it, and we launched a case study. And I, I just had one question I wanted to answer, and that is, are the claims we were seeing, you know, 10 to 20 percent savings, realistic? in commercial buildings from purely operational improvements, no major equipment changes or capital expenses? And the answer is yes. I'm going to take you through what we found. First, I had to find a partner, someone to study. And I met with many real estate companies, and tower companies emerged as a great partner. They were just at the beginning of launching a project which enabled me to study it from the beginning through a full year. Now, Tower Companies is a company that is committed to sustainability. That's evidenced in their portfolio, in their operations. And I think that's important because you know, I think it kind of cuts two ways in the context of a study. You know, first, these are great buildings to start with. So finding operational savings one would think, should be harder as compared to the typical building of a similar size. I think that's true. 
But secondly, it kind of cuts the other way in the sense that, you know, is what Tower did genuinely replicable in the typical building? Because the typical building owner may not have the culture attuned to efficiency opportunities and sustainability. Those are important questions, but I think the results here will speak for themselves. Tower's project was led by their sustainability uh, manager, David Borchardt, who was wonderful to work with, and he entered this project with three requirements. So, you know, I want feedback from the meter and analytics on the meter data. I want to monitor the buildings using meter data 24-7 with alarms looking for anomalies. And I need help to optimize the building. I need a trusted advisor. So he, before he came up with these requirements, he, you know, he tells the story that periodically he would get messages from accounting saying, hey, why was the utility bill two months ago so high in a certain building? Well, two or three months later, it's just way too long after the event to diagnose the problem with any precision. And that led him to ask for these requirements. He engaged two service providers. One company, at site was mainly responsible for monitoring the metering data, providing uh, advice, establishing a plan for the buildings, and they set out with a 7% goal to reduce energy use. And he engaged a company called HVAC Concepts, which was responsible for making changes to the systems primarily and monitoring the BMS itself. They installed metering hardware, and this was a substantial cost to the project. They collected interval data from the building's master meter. There were three buildings, each was master metered. They installed small submeters on the chillers to obtain accurate reads on chiller usage. The data could be delivered externally, you know, in real time. I put that in quotes because, you know, it minutes to many minutes later, but it was every 15-minute data that was delivered you know, during the day to the external vendors' data centers where they could do the analytics and monitor it. And they installed controls which allowed HVAC concepts to set or reset BMS settings remotely changing set points, for example. Now, at site engaged in what they called a light-up phase, and I found this very instructive. You know, first they configured an online portal for the engineers to obtain meter results and reports. They baselined the buildings looking at prior year data so that they could tell at any given time how a building during the subject year compared to the prior year adjusting for weather. And the, an at-site engineer did a full walkthrough of each building. And in this context, I saw two interesting things. First, they sat with the building engineer and talked. They talked about the typical startup routine, shutdown routine. They looked at BMS settings. They talked about known issues that the engineer knew. They looked at major systems in the building. And in the course of that, they identified several items to correct just through that walkthrough phase, systems that were set to manual, set points that were not right, where a heater and the chiller might compete with each other, or where the, the dead band was too narrow between when the chiller would come on and shut off. And I think one takeaway from that is just the importance of the people in this entire uh, mission. This is a data story, there's no doubt about that, but it's also a people story. The engineer in the building needs an advisor focused on efficiency in many cases to uh, obtain results. At site then delivered analytics and reports daily. The report that I've copied here 
was for the prior day. It showed up in the engineer's email inbox first thing in the morning, and copies were sent to uh, building's team at Tower generally so that management could observe it, but it was primarily aimed at the engineer. Provides a visual picture of what happened the prior day and some interesting metrics. Now, I want to focus here on what problems were found. I'm going to back up once. The daily report shows the visual picture, but the question then is, what do you do with that? And when there are anomalies, alarms went off in the sense that phone calls were made, emails were sent. Hey, there's a problem. Let's figure it out. Now, this graph shows the electricity usage of two chillers. If you remember, I said they sub-metered their chillers through the course of one day, two chillers in the same building. And what you see is that chiller number two was coming on and off, on and off at around 3 o'clock. Now, one observation that that site team made to the engineer is it shouldn't be coming on at all because chiller one obviously is not at its uh, capacity. But secondly, something's causing it to come on and off. And the actual reason why is probably not as interesting as the fact that they caught it quickly. This could have been happening for months. And you know, the interesting insight here is that how would you detect this anomaly without looking at the data? You'd have to be standing at the chiller listening for the second unit to come on and make the conclusion why is it coming on. That typically doesn't happen. So the meter data here enabled them to catch the problem, which turned out to be a controls problem, something called a lockout sequence, which prevents the second chiller from coming on until the first chiller is at a certain capacity, wasn't set properly. They fixed that. Second incident that's really instructive is they found VAV controls that were causing the chiller to come on when it shouldn't, variable air controls. And if you look at the left-hand side of the chart, you can see the chiller spiked in the middle of the night. Again, difficult to detect without the meter data pointing to it. You'd have to be there in the building hearing it come on, or as David Borchart described, months later, you've got a question about why is the bill so high. So here, the VAVs in certain floors had controls that were calling the chiller to come on even though the BMS was saying stay off. So it wasn't a error of setting the BMS settings, you might look at the BMS, the building management system, and think that it's all set appropriately. But again, controls break, and that's what happened here. They caught it, corrected it quickly. This is very interesting, I think, and, and, and again, instructive. This chart, the top and bottom are the same chart, two different periods, shows the electricity usage of one building on many different days. So you can see the building coming on, electricity usage, at around 5.30 or 6 a.m., going through the course of the day, shutting down 6 or 7 at night, and the horizontal lines are weekends. Well, at site noticed that the nighttime usage was number one, different on different days, so question mark. Number two, high on some days. What's going on? They found the problem. And again, a problem very difficult to detect would go on for months without this kind of diagnosis. What they found were certain controls in the air handlers that were calling the chiller to turn on because of some software that's called Optimal Start Software, which when it works well, predicts when the building should turn on based on weather data and schedules. But here it was calling for some of the air handlers to come on 
at the wrong time, and that then triggered the chiller to come on. So uh, just kind of high-level takeaway is difficult to detect without meter data, and these are errors that occur not because of poor operations or negligence of any sort. Things break. And then the last incident is a similar story. A sensor in the air handling unit was calling for the chiller to come on when it shouldn't. And it was coming on early in the morning, 3 a.m., shutting down. So unless the engineer is in the building at 3, you're probably not going to detect this. And then again in the evening, coming on, going off. So those were four incidents. Now, what did we find over the course of the year? We found that in each of the buildings, it's a similar story, but different results because these are different buildings. On average, there was a 13% savings in 2012 versus the baseline year of 2011. Now, we normalized for weather, heating and cooling degree days, and occupancy. This is electricity only. And note that 1909K, the building with 17% savings, has electric heat. The other buildings have or had uh, fuel oil heat. So savings from heating efficiencies weren't counted in those two buildings' results. I'll also note that 1828, the building that had a 7% savings, it's the largest of the three buildings and had a brand new chiller. I think it was two years before our study began. So the opportunities to save there, you would think, would have been much lower. And they were lower than the other buildings, but still substantial. Now, one more view of the results, a little more detail. Well, first, look, these are Energy Star buildings to start with. And they all improved on the Energy Star score. I'll let you look at the, the data. We'll take questions uh, at the end of the presentation. There's a lot to ask about here, but you can see the uh, expense savings and the kilowatt hours per square foot dropping markedly. Now, I think tower savings are even greater than what we showed. And it's for a couple reasons. First, as I noted, we only measured electricity. And in talking with tower and at site recently, after a second year of the project, anecdotally, they say that the results show even greater savings from gas and water, which we didn't think that we should try to measure in our study, focusing on electricity. But the savings from less cooling, less wasted energy in cooling, allowed them to save water from evaporation from the cooling tower, which is a major source of water use in buildings. Very important. Tower believes, and I think everything we've seen so far suggests it's right, that the kinds of corrections made will lead to lower maintenance expenses. Catching the chiller from running when it shouldn't run and cycling on and off, those kinds of things, will add years to the useful life of the equipment. And then most important of all, very hard to measure, but the results probably swamp the energy savings. Tower's confident that better buildings will make for better tenant satisfaction higher rents, and greater occupancy over time. Now, what explains these savings that we just saw? I think I've mentioned it along the way, but let's crystallize it. You know, number one, it's catching stray quickly, not weeks or months later, and not focusing on preventing stray, which obviously is an important part of running buildings, but it's going to happen, even in the best buildings. The question is, when are you going to catch it? Do you let it persist, or do you try to catch it quickly? 
Now, the engineers and the operators, the, the people who are responsible for running the buildings, as everybody knows, have many priorities to deal with every day. Tenants complain, there are hot spots, there are cold spots, there are problems. Giving the engineers a kind of checklist of what to do, which is one of the functions at site provided in their regular reports and meeting with the engineer, really helped. Check your set points. Assure that there's a dead band. We're coming up on cooling season. You know, shift these things. And then third, as I mentioned early, this is a story about data, but it's a story about people too. The engineers were engaged. They trusted the advisors. They trusted the information. They felt the, the new information was valuable, and they acted on it. Now, expenses are obviously a very important part of this story. We saw the savings. What did it cost? To sub-meter the bill, well, so back up one step. What I've done is put the total for the three buildings on the left-hand column, and then I averaged it on the right. But each building had different expenses. So the average, I think, is uh, instructive, but not representative of any specific building. So to sub-meter the buildings was a significant cost. At site had a setup fee to do the walkthrough, to baseline the buildings, to do all the things we described. And at site charged a kind of subscription of sorts to monitor the buildings, to deliver the reports, as did HVAC the mo to monitor the BMS. I included a cost for uh, the engineering time and management time that we observed. And number six is that in one of the buildings, they engaged in upgrading the BMS uh, through HVAC, and that was a cost, which it goes into the total, which then gets averaged out. So the average cost for year one, which includes all the light up and install costs, was $48,000 per building. That will produce $21,000 in annual expenses going forward, just the monitoring cost, because the install cost will have been taken care of. And then going back to the electricity savings information we saw earlier, much greater. This is a project that not only paid for itself in year one, but produced a profit. Now, what are the lessons learned that, that I've concluded? I think there's a lot to take away here. but. I focused on number one, I'm repeating myself for the third time, but it's very important. Stray is inevitable. Meter data can help catch it quickly. The engineers need actionable suggestions. Now, early on, I mentioned in the install, as part of the install cost, at site set up an online kind of dashboard. We didn't see the engineers use that at all. They looked at the reports coming to them. They uh, closely uh, watched the alerts and the alarms and acted on them. But they didn't go uh, to the online site to search or to just uh, see what's happening. As I mentioned, they're busy. They're keeping the buildings running. I don't think necessarily you want them uh, playing around with tools that might not be actionable. The checklist approach was very important, giving the engineers, again, specific things to do that can be adjusted by season. And again, it's a story about data, but it's a story about people and the engineers trusting the experts. Now, one thing that Tower will describe David Borchardt, the project leader, is that you know, early on in the project, he saw other large leading real estate companies, many of the largest, doing this kind of work in-house, building a team to monitor many buildings. They can't do that. They're not big enough. And most building owners in the country can't do that. And that's the role of the outside experts, to supplement the engineer's capability in the building to monitor the building and to learn from alarms. Last, 
management set goals. The engineers were supported by that. They knew that what they were doing was an important part of their job. They set a goal of 7%, which they basically doubled. And having that management support from our observations made a big difference. Now, I want to transition for one second into a new way of thinking about this data. I'm looking forward to your questions on the study results. And I want to kind of plant a seed based on a market trend that um, I think is happening. You know, first, I think there's strong evidence that market leaders like tower companies, uh, many other large uh, leading real estate companies, are adopting meter-based analytics as part of their energy management and as part of their building management function, especially happening in large buildings and in Class A buildings. But small and medium-sized buildings are different, and there's lots of them. They may not have a full-time engineer. The cost of new metering is probably a deterrent. The savings might be uncertain, and, un and therefore the owner might be unwilling to invest. So the question I would pose is, is there a role for utilities? to then help that class of building owners to obtain just very basic meter intelligence that they can use to run their buildings better. You know, number one, the utility already has the data. There's no need to install new metering, especially in places where the utility is invested in smart meters. They've got the interval data. Getting it back to the owner the next day or even the next week is soon enough for them to learn from it. It doesn't have to be real time is one of the, I think, lessons here, even though that's the title of our report. What I came away with was, yes, you can do a lot with that data, but you can do a lot with next day data, with next week data. And then third for the possibility of a utility pilot program of some sort, it could be only those owners and operators who can raise their hand and say, yes, we'd like to participate in that. It would be very interesting to see what happens. And what might they deliver? I kind of think of it as benchmarking 2.0. I mean, we know what benchmarking is. That when building owners get monthly Energy Star scores, it's helpful. They understand where their building is. It lets them uh, share that information with market participants. But that's really course measuring, monthly data. Maybe benchmarking 2.0 has finer points that come out of the more finely grained meter data. What was your average nighttime use per square foot? What was your average daytime use per square foot? Allowing the owner then to identify, is there something happening at night or is it all the time? What was going on on the weekend? What was the start time? When did I shut down the building? And how do those compare to other buildings? And then most interesting, looking for anomalies relative to your own history. You know, spikes, the kinds of things that we saw um, in the incidents that I described where the chiller was coming on and off. Now, it's certain that you know, master meter data on a large building might not reveal all of the kinds of anomalies we saw. But many of them are revealed. And as software gets better to look at the data, to subtract out base load, to subtract out plug load potentially, I trust that we will get better at identifying these anomalies. So in the context of a potential utility program, I think the problem to solve for is that it needs to be actionable, right? Utility bills typically go to the accounting group, and here we need something to go to the engineer. And maybe it's a part-time engineer. Maybe it's an engineer who has responsibility for multiple buildings. So in case studies 
like this one, but others that need to be done, I think one question is what do we need to conclude that would support a utility pilot that could test many of these ideas? Okay, so that is what we found in our report. I hope that it's instructive, and I trust that there are a lot of questions that um, we could talk about. Thanks so much, Philip. We can get started with the questions. Um, this is a question from Mark. <clears throat> could some of these problems that were found via the real-time metering also be identified using trending data with existing BAS systems? So that's a great question. You know, a couple, a couple thoughts. You know, number one, I think it depends on the, the system in place. Um, I think it, it's a, it's definitely correct that much of what we saw here um, are, you know, are functions that new, advanced BMS systems can deliver to the building engineer and the owner. There's no doubt about that. But you're assuming then that you've got to upgrade that system um, to a new advanced system to get these functions. And you know, when we think about how can we get these functions deployed to large numbers of buildings, you know, that's a slow process. And potentially expensive, potentially more expensive than layering on uh, meter data analytics. But I think you're right. Yes, BMS systems can do that. And then the second thought I would offer on that is that some of what we saw in anomalies that were found in meter data happened when the BMS said that everything was normal. That it does occur that software has glitches and that sensors break, so the BMS relies on the sensor. If the sensor breaks, then potentially you may not see the results. Now, I think what your question implied is with trending data, maybe there's another source of the data. It's looking at the meter data as well and squaring up the meter data with what the settings are. Um, so two, two thoughts on that good question. Great. Thank you. This is a question from Scott. What is the definition of a Class A building? Do you consider the buildings in the study to be small, medium, or large buildings? Okay, that's a great question. And it's a question I can't answer. I think most folks, I'm going to go back to the results here. Most folks in the industry can know Class A when they see it, and there's all sorts of definitions um, that would be difficult to resolve here. These, I think, everyone would agree were Class A buildings, meaning they compete for top-tier tenants. Rents are in the range of uh, comparable buildings in Washington, D.C. I use that phrase here only to distinguish buildings and building owners and operators in their potential appetite to invest in this kind of function. What I meant by that is you know, with buildings where the owner might not be competing for tenants who um, have a commitment to only locate in Energy Star buildings, so in Washington, D.C., that's you know, the GSA and large financial institutions and law firms. In other places and in other buildings, they might have less incentive than to get their building up on the Energy Star metric. Um, so that's why I use that phrase. And are they large? Well, Washington's peculiar because of the height restriction. You have a lot of buildings in this kind of range. You know, each of these buildings is a kind of 10-story, 9, 10-story building of uh, the same dimensions as, you know, four or five other buildings on the same block. In New York, these are probably small buildings. Not necessarily. There are a lot of buildings of this size in New York City and other large cities. But in most cities in the country, these are substantial office buildings. I think that's, that's fair to say. Great. Thanks. Emily um, says, you mentioned that en engineers didn't use the dashboard. 
doesn't the dashboard use the meter data? Why why not use the engineers to create an action list based on that meter data? And lastly, how can dashboards be designed to better engage the engineers? Yeah. It's a good question, and I don't know the answer to it. I, I simply ob reported what we observed here, which is that um, the online s dashboard was available. What we saw is that the engineers uh, responded to the interaction between the outside advisor, their advice, and um, the anomaly reported, trying to figure it out. Um, and in many cases, just kind of back up a step, in many cases, knowing that there's a problem is then like looking for a needle in a haystack. But having granularity about when the problem occurs and other uh, other people's take on why it might be occurring, people who see similar problems across many buildings, which again is kind of one of the values of having an outside expert, um, helps them narrow down where to look, uh, makes the problem quicker and easier to find. Now, I don't know then what that means in terms of, say, product development of a good dashboard. Um, it seems to me the essential function is giving the person responsible for running the building, you know, here the engineer, but it's not always an engineer, giving that person actionable advice they can take and use to correct the problem. Okay, and to piggyback on that, Matthew wanted to know, was there any significant pushback from the engineers or any feelings of threat from the outside experts? So that that's really interesting. I, we didn't see it, but in talking with uh, both the folks at Tower and the team at AtSight, we did hear that early on in the project, the outside team thought it would be very helpful to have uh, more senior operations folks, it was David Borchardt and his team, to attend some of the meetings and help reinforce the need to act on the suggestions and that that made a big difference. And then, you know, after that kind of early uh, engagement, the relationships built and it was a much better uh, path to success from there. Now, I've, I have heard just anecdotally from you know, other projects and other building owners and operators that the dynamic the question suggests is a, is a real risk to observe. Um, we didn't see too much of it, and I think, you know, again, just based on observations, that it's minimized when the interaction is kind of data-based. It's not a person coming in saying, I know how to run your building better. It's a person saying, hey, look what this chart shows. And then a second kind of uh, response to that issue that um, I think is actually uh, true across many buildings is that the engineer knows the building usually very well and it's a complicated piece of machinery as a system. And many parts of the system might be held together with duct tape and Band-Aids. And it's run a certain way because it was always run a certain way. And they turn it on at 3 in the morning when it's cold out because that's what they've always done. Um, and to come in and help uh, the engineers look at those things fresh and try new things requires a relationship that has to be built. Um, and it probably is difficult to simply pop in and provide the engineer with what feels like I have a second guess outsiders. Right, that's really interesting. Kevin would like to know, is there a cost per kilowatt hour where meter level energy work is not worthwhile? Uh, what was the tower's kilowatt hour cost? Okay, great question. So is it, let me look at the next slide to see if it's shown here. Their electricity rate, 
which I think is what the questioner is asking, was in the 13 cents per kilowatt hour ballpark. It's not shown on this chart. In the report, if you'll look at the actual report, um, which we can provide you a link to, the cost information is, is provided. Um, but it was around 13 cents a kilowatt hour. And so I think the answer to the question is, sure. Um, if you, if, a per, if an owner were asking the question, um, you know, what expense will I endure to save a certain amount of electricity, they're going to look at uh, those two numbers. And if rates are very low, then you'd have to save a lot to uh, justify an expense. But I, I think in most buildings, one of the insights that you know, we need more research on, there's no doubt about it, but the insights is the savings in other ways can be very powerful. We definitely need more research. The maintenance expenses, for example, which we pointed to in our report but didn't try to quantify, could potentially be very large. In, in many markets, increasing your building's uh, efficiency level could help you compete for a bit more tenants. It may help you keep tenants you have longer, which of course is a primary concern for any owner. Um, and with the advent and uh, expansion of benchmarking around the country where there will be more transparency to building energy use, enabling prospective tenants to have a better sense of what expenses are likely to be. Um, you know, ri owners risk being left behind if they don't begin to get a handle on how their building is run. Um, so I hope that's responsive to the question. Absolutely, thank you. David would like to know, do the annual recurring monitor co monitoring costs of 21000 per building extend beyond year two for a tower? If so, can these costs be justified after the initial year one and year two savings are realized? Will later years produce enough energy savings to justify these monitoring costs? Okay, that's a, again, all very good questions. This is very important because <clears throat> with the idea that I kind of uh, ended with that there's a potential for a utility program, understanding costs and benefits becomes very important. So a couple things. You know, number one, let's just get the numbers again. Yeah, 21.8 is the amount of year two um, kind of subscription is the way I, I think of it. In year three, they fully covered the install costs in year one. A very important point which I didn't describe is how does Tower treat both the costs and benefits here in its buildings? And this is going to vary by uh, building owner and by lease structure. Um, here, the kinds of leases in place enable Tower companies to realize a portion of the electricity savings from its own account, but the lion's share of the electricity savings, the $218,000 that occurred in year one, would be um, the benefit to the tenant. These are costs that otherwise are, utility costs are otherwise passed through to the tenant, so they realize the savings. But the same is true for expenses. So the expenses of the project um, vary in, in terms of how they're apportioned to tenants. Tower endured and bore the certain costs of installing and getting the systems set up, but were able to pass through to tenants many of the expenses of uh, the service as an operating expense of the building, which makes sense given that they're realizing the benefits as well. So that's important to the question. But then third, where it gets really tricky is how you think of persistence here. And I think it's a mistake to move the baseline each year. And what I mean by that is at the end of the subject year here where we saw 
uh, energy use go down. The question is, if you ended this service and this project, would expenses stay there or would they bounce up some? And if that, the answer to that will just depend on the building, depend on the systems in place, depend on the people in place. Um, but if you concur with my observation that a large part of the savings here occurred by catching stray quickly and that stray will occur in even the best buildings, then I think you have to assume that keeping it in place is preventing that cost that you saw in the prior year and that if you remove the function, costs are not necessarily going to stay low. But we need much more research on that and it, it's you're, the, the, an actual answer to that question is something I can't give in terms of um, data from this study. That's great. Vincent wants to know, how is metering analysis different from a cost analysis? Recent major renovations in the Empire State Building did not use meter data, but rather it was used through cost analysis from accounting and basic equipment analysis. Well, they're different in a couple ways. I mean, I think number one, um, there was no renovation here. And so if one were engaging in a renovation, the analysis would be different. You'd look at the capital expense, you know, how long it took to implement, what the costs were of implementation and what your expected savings are going to be, et cetera. Um, this is not that kind of project. In this project, we're looking to catch things going wrong and correct them, not make equipment changes. Now, that's not to say that making equipment changes and renovating the building you know, is not worthwhile. It certainly may be. And, and in fact, one of the outcomes of this project, after you know, some number of months, tower companies noticed that the potential savings from switching out a boiler would uh, justify the, the cost of doing so. And they went ahead with that project. It, it happened outside of the subject year here, so we didn't describe it in the report. But I think it, it's instructive that engaging in deeper analysis of how your building is operated can point to the kinds of renovations that then make sense from a cost perspective. OK. Peter wants to know, how many man hours were put into the day-to-day -day monitoring of these buildings by AtSite and HVACC? This would seem to be the biggest cost involved for the vendor or utility. Yeah, the answer is, I don't know. Um, I know what they charged. So you, I, up on the screen now, you should see the project expenses and AtSite's annual cost per building. In that cost, it, it, in the an earlier question was, you know, is that cost present for year two in the 2021-8? You know, yes, that's the cost of those man hours. Um, we didn't then delve into the vendor's operations to you know, determine how much time they're um, devoting here. But, but I will say this. I, I think the, the notion of engaging an expert to perform this function makes a lot of sense. Um, they're probably going to devote less time to find any given error than the building engineer would by looking at charts. I mean, they're better at it. They do it a lot. They have many other buildings that they do it with, so they see patterns. They also have tools. Uh, they've developed software to throw up red flags in certain instances, thus minimizing the amount of time they've got to kind of eyeball charts. Um, I think those reasons, you know, a, as in other industries, suggest that um, you know expertise here can really add value. Right. Great. Brian would like to know regarding attribution and expected persistence of savings. Were there any occupancy education um, 
like a lights out campaign or something going on parallel with this study? No, um, there, there were not. And so it, it's my understanding just you know, in talking with the power folks that they are starting to do some of that, but that was not happening during this uh, study. And we, we would have definitely, uh, you know, commented on that as a, uh, a factor that might have accounted for some of the savings, but we didn't see any of that. Um, now, I w will say that some of the tenants, although not many, I think it was like one or two in these three buildings were sub-metered tenants, so they paid for their own plug load and lighting, but only a few, and it was not a major portion of the square footage that was accounted for in that regard. Okay, another question from Vincent. Was there any type of procedural guide or cookbook approach used? I believe you refer to that as, a, uh, as the checklist approach. Can we see the checklist? Okay, um, I don't have it. Um, and you know that there's not like a one pager, but yes, the answer is yes. They developed and gave each engineer what they called a guide. And um, it went through kinds of seasonal changes that should be contemplated, you know, um, in advance of the season arriving. So, you know, as you approach cooling season, what do you do? And it's my understanding that they gave then, in addition to the guide, each building engineer a kind of short list of things to watch based on what they saw in that building. So it was customized. Um, the the at-site team had this is not the right name for it, but it's kind of the equivalent of an account manager who was responsible for the buildings. And that person then could do You know, it's got a short list of things to check regularly that help keep the building, you know, healthy. Great. Just uh, one more question from Fred. When looking at the savings from catching problems quickly with better monitoring, did you count only the savings that would occur prior to when they would have, would have otherwise caught the problem with prior quality oversight? Well, we couldn't. Yeah, it, that would be a lovely thing to do, but we, we couldn't engage in that. What we did is used year-over-year -year, um, comparison. Let me quickly just back up. So 2011 was the year prior to our study. We took total electricity usage in that year. We got a heating and cooling degree days, and we got occupancy data, and we quizzed the owners and the engineers about what was happening in the buildings and affirmed there were no extraordinary events that would have dramatically or materially affected usage. We then did the same thing for 2012 and compared the two. It was very simple. We didn't try to do a measure-based assessment of, okay, you caught this problem. How much did you save from that? How long might it have persisted if you didn't catch it? Um, I think it'll be very difficult to do, and it really kind of points to the opportunity here as well, which is that you don't know. You, you don't know how long that chiller would run, you know, at 2 in the morning if we hadn't caught it. Great. Well, this concludes the talk on energy real time management in commercial office buildings. We would like to thank Philip very much for joining us this afternoon. If you want to view a recording of the webinar, please visit Blueprint for Efficiency page on iTunes U. And don't forget to tune in next Thursday, February 27th, with Enernoc on developing a common energy language. This is Lizzie from the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. Thanks for listening.